Boy, oh boy. Uh, that was a... Let's go ahead and reel it back in. A very good friend of mine played a divination wizard in a game of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that I was running a few years ago, the campaign for which fell apart because statistically every campaign is destined to fall apart. Destiny, however, was the gnomish wizard Nestor Yimble's entire jam. Divination wizards in 5th edition have the ability to use their magic to see into the future and get flashes of possibilities, which manifests in several very interesting abilities. Looking into the future and changing the outcome of situations to your Advantage is a super cool ability in theory, but in practice it gets somewhat muddied because it forces assumptions about what kind of time the universe that you are playing or writing in has. Basically, precognition and time travel all have the same conceptual problems, and this makes it difficult as a mechanism to use in fiction without it being extremely hokey and hand wavy. The author has to decide whether time is fixed and immutable, or whether it can be altered, or whether there's infinite timelines, etc. It touches on determinism versus free will, and fundamentally becomes a question of whether anything can be believed when it comes from a source involved in the divining or traveling, because that information might come from a reality wherein things have changed enough that the information is either irrelevant or flat out damaging to the reality where the characters we follow live. So with all of that in mind, let's talk about Stephen King's The Dead Zone. Written in 1979, this is apparently the only book that King actually planned out in its entirety before writing it and liked the results enough to publish. Now the wording there makes me think that there might be other unpublished works that had an outline which are stuffed into an old desk drawer or something that will not see the light of day until King is far and dead. And I'm interested in that, but that's neither here nor there. That's a story for a different time. The Dead Zone is a story about a man who gains the power of precognition and clairvoyance after surviving a couple life-threatening accidents and a subsequent several-year coma. From this point onward, as with all my videos, there are spoilers. We yeah. Spoilers. So please be advised. If you could go back in time and kill Hitler, would you do it? This question actually literally gets asked in this book, and I wonder if this wasn't the premise upon which the entire story was built, except instead of going back in time, the main character acquires knowledge that a certain politician will destroy the world. Let's do a little character study for John Smith the main character of the book. What a generic name. John is a school teacher at the beginning of the story after the prologue. All he wants is to marry the girl he likes, teach high school, and be a normal guy. However, thanks to a little head trauma that he experienced when he was very small in the prologue, he has little flashes of insight about what is very likely to happen in the future. And they always end up being true. He uses this on a date with his girl one time. They, they go to a carnival and there's one of those carnival gambling games and he completely cleans out. It's like a roulette wheel. They do the spin and the ball goes down into it and it's not casino roulette. This one is obviously rigged, but he cleans him out by predicting this roulette game like 10 times in a row or something while his girl Sarah begins her battle with food poisoning from a bad hot dog that they had earlier. And then that evening, he gets into a horrible car accident that knocks him into the five-year-long coma where everyone expects him to be brain dead forever. His girl moves on and gets married and has a kid, some like minor politician or whatever. Uh, the communists win the war because this is during the... Vietnam War? I'm not very good with my American history. The communists win the war, and for the most part, everything seems to progress without Johnny around, finally. As a coma patient, he racks up ridiculous medical bills because the United States and his long hospital stay makes that happen and everyone expects him to die. His father even hopes and prays one time that he does die. But then he wakes up, because of course he wakes up, this wouldn't be an interesting story if that were not the case, and that's a big problem in itself. Being in a coma really puts a lot of strain on one's body because of muscle atrophy and shortening of tendons and all of that business, so Johnny's whole 
life is wrecked. He goes through several excruciatingly painful surgeries to lengthen his tendons and has a ton of physical therapy in order to even be able to walk at all again, something that they told him he wouldn't. So he is, for all purposes, a time traveler, in the same way that Kyon travels time in Nagito's bedroom in Haruhi. Does anybody remember that show, or am I just the only one who remembers? Anyway, uh, man, that... That was, a sh that was the first show that gave me, like, my first real adult existential crisis in college. Uh, it was a bad time. My old college roommate, Max, can tell you all about it. Anyway, so we have Johnny, whose first action after waking up is to touch a nurse on, like, the elbow or something. And he gets this predictive vision. And this continues time after time, where nobody believes him until he either forces their hand or a bad thing happens and they only realize that he was right after the fact. This is the fate of every precognate and psychometer, the Cassandra effect, where the Oracle Cassandra would be like, hey, bad thing's gonna happen. And they're like, no, it totally isn't. And then it happens, and then they either are like, oh no, Cassandra, you were right, or else worse. Like, every Cassandra is burdened with the knowledge of the future and the fact that nobody will believe them. During one such instance for Johnny's life, for instance, he tries to warn everyone that a certain restaurant is going to be struck by lightning and burned down with everyone inside during a big graduation party. And while he does manage to get some of the people who would have gone to the party to stay away, the place does get struck by lightning and does burn down, and someone in instantly blames Johnny for causing the fire, like the girl in that book, Carrie. So, to sidestep, for just a second, the fact that a character references the Stephen King book, Carrie, within the Stephen King book, The Dead Zone, calls into question quite a lot of stuff. Like, for instance, we know that Castle Rock, a location that shows up in a bunch of King's works, is real, and a significant plot point happens in Castle Rock. But Carrie is explicitly a work of fiction within the world where Castle Rock is real. The Dead Zone is in, for instance, the same universe as Cujo, the one where people get stuck in a car with a rabid dog outside, because there is a crossover character in Sheriff George Bannerman, who explicitly recalls the instance of him asking for help in the Dead Zone, because he asks Johnny for help with the case, when he's looking for some missing people in Cujo. And then Bannerman's deputy, Frank Dodd, who is a serial killer in the Dead Zone, comes back as a ghost in Cujo. Cujo himself actually appears in the form of a restless ghost in the other book, Needful Things, and all in all, there are nine novels and six short stories set in Castle Rock, and just so many others that reference the place. So The Dead Zone is, chronologically, the first book to reference the city within the books that King has written. But Carrie is set in Chamberlain, Maine, which is a real place, actual real, like, in our IRL world, real place. And since it is Stephen King's first published novel, it stands to reason that Castle Rock, which shows up here the first time, had not yet been created. But King then also created a town called Ludlow in Maine for Pet Cemetery and The Dark Half that turns out to actually be a real place in Maine. So it's wildly confusing as to the levels of meta that the King stories end up sharing with each other. And then everything all gets tied back together with the Dark Tower series, which is just way out and like in a thousand different places. So there's a lot going on. But anyway, there are a couple really big themes and variations within the story, so I want to talk about them, because that's what we do here. First and foremost is the trope of the reluctant hero, which shows up in basically every hero's journey wheel as the, the first step in the thing. The refusal of the call is what it is often called, and Johnny actually does this several times in the story before finally deciding that his inaction is so much worse than actually getting involved in everything would be. And initially, so like after he woke up after the coma, he sort of accidentally showed that he has this ability to the nurse that he touched on the elbow, but directly thereafter he finds out how dangerous it actually is to be in the public eye with psychic powers. There's a, a decent amount of time in the story where he just tries to straight 
disappear, and he does manage to uh, skirt the public eye a few times, but then some terrible thing happens, and he feels like he's being forced into doing something about it, and he has to come back into the public. This happens with the serial killer in Castle Rock, this happens with the restaurant fire during his peaceful life as a private tutor, and it happens with the murderous politician Stilson. Every time he is forced out of a life that's at least somewhat quiet, into the national spotlight yet again, and each time the consequences get worse for him. So this theme here is weighing the consequences of one's inaction, when taking action would save people's lives, at the cost of one's own comfort. And it comes to a head when Johnny's journals reveal that there's no possible way for him to be at peace with himself if he doesn't do something, but his only reason real choice is to kill the guy. Is it ever acceptable to kill someone so that other people might live? Is it ever okay to trade one life for another, even if the one you'd kill is a menace to humanity? That's the main sort of, like, question, the main moral quandary in the Dead Zone. Johnny asks a bunch of people the Hitler time travel, go back in time kill Hitler sort of question to gauge whether his own resolve in killing Stilson is justified, since it is essentially the same same thing, but based off of his precognition instead of based off of actual history and going back in time. He knows that Stilson is going to destroy the world with a nuclear war, but of course, as mentioned, nobody would believe him if he told them. And there is a possibility that he is wrong somehow, even though he knows that he's never once been wrong about anything in any of his precognitive flashes. His choices are limited. Do nothing, and either the world ends or nothing happens. Kill Stilson, and become universally hated by everyone who was a Stilson stan, and either the world gets saved or nothing happens. It's a pretty big spread of outcomes, one that takes me back to the days when my fundy Christian high school was trying really hard to indoctrinate everyone into becoming Christianity apologists, and where the concept of Pascal's wager was leaned on so hard that I'm surprised it could bear the weight of all the idiots at that school. Another theme explored is the idea of atonement as a sort of character arc. Johnny first catches the atonement bug when his crazy religious cultist mother dies and begs him on her deathbed to accept that his powers were part of some kind of plan from one would guess a loving god. It was Johnny's televised demonstration of his powers that finally pushed his mother into heart attack territory, and for at least a little while he blames himself for the fact that she died. The one who really gets this, however, is Johnny's employer, Roger. Roger is the father of the boy that Johnny is private tutoring, like I mentioned earlier. Johnny is trying to go back into teaching, but now that people know who he is, it's impossible for him to get a teaching job with a normal school, and also the horrible scars from the surgery and the accident and all that are making it pretty difficult for him to be in front of a classroom. This guy, Roger, finds out that he is a good teacher and knows that his own son is fantastically talented when it comes to sports, but not really talented talented when it comes to brain, and so he figures, why not put Johnny on the case, he can probably fix it. Roger's the father of that boy, and he does not believe for even a moment in Johnny's quote-unquote psychic garbage. He does, however, believe in his ability to teach, and for that reason he employs Johnny to help get his son into a prestigious college by increasing his literacy level. I mean, Johnny's an English teacher, of course Johnny's an English teacher. Johnny does do this extremely well, like his job is right up his alley there, and it's on the night of that big graduation party that we mentioned earlier that Johnny has the flash about the restaurant burning down. Roger decides to humor Johnny and offers it as an alternative to the restaurant a party at his own own big manor house, but it's not because he believes Johnny. It is solely 100% to placate him, to humor him, like a parent who checks under their child's bed for monsters before they go to sleep. And then, uh, the lightning hits the place, it doesn't have lightning rods, the place does burn down, half of the people who went to the restaurant instead of coming to Roger's, all of them die horribly in this, this terrible fire, trapped inside, roasting alive, etc, etc. It's a bad time for everyone involved. Roger then spends the next very long time in the book trying to track Johnny down after Johnny flees and give him money as a way of making up for the fact that his disbelief was, in some part, responsible for the deaths of all of those kids. 
he pays off Johnny's exorbitant medical bills, and he continually tries to send him money in the mail, which, I mean, I would take it if I was getting that kind of opportunity, you know, PhD funding isn't coming from nowhere. Johnny's dad says that Roger is atoning in the only way that he knows how to do it, by throwing money at it like he throws money at every problem. Atonement is an important theme in stories like this one because there exists an element of atoning for an action that has not yet been taken, or an action that is prevented from happening, right? Like Johnny's vision of Stilson puts him in the position of having to kill this guy in order to prevent the suffering that would happen if he didn't kill him. So in one way of reading it, Johnny's actions can be seen as him trying to make up for the fact that he knows about this information in the first place by preventing the bad things from happening as a result of him knowing this information. Johnny's powers themselves are actually really interesting as well, because he has two of these sort of common common psychic powers that show up in a lot of King's work and in a lot of other work that deals with psychic stuff. In Stephen King's Rose Red, my favorite film from King, by the way, there is a character who has precognition, and there is a character who has psychometry, but Johnny here had enough skill points during his build to build into both of those skill trees. Precognition is, like we've mentioned, functionally the same as time travel in a lot of ways, but psychometry is actually more akin to traditional divination. It's when you touch a thing and then you know some stuff about it. It's past, it's significance, who the thing might have belonged to, even visions of what this object may have seen or experienced in so much as that an object can see or experience anything, right? And the combination of these two powers together is what makes Johnny's abilities so powerful and so interesting. I mean, it's a little hit or miss to pin down, but I think it can be generalized for psychometry for objects, both powers for people. Take the case of the reporter at the hospital, for instance. The reporter gives him a necklace, medallion, brooch, I don't remember, uh, and then a few things happen. First, it's an object, so the psychometry happens. Johnny touches it and gains knowledge about that thing, and sees events that happened around it. Then, in seeing those events, he's got a person, the sister of the reporter, and since she's dead, there's no future to look to, so the psychometry happens, again recursively back, this time focused on the sister. And then Johnny knows everything about the dead sister, and quite a bit about the reporter who's trying to do this gotcha moment on live television. Take again also the case of Dr. Wysak's first experience with these powers. Like Johnny touches the doctor and the psychometry flashes on. He gains knowledge that the doctor keeps a photo in his wallet of his mother, who he thinks is dead. Johnny then asks to touch the picture, which seems to imply that his powers can jump from objects to people and then maybe back to objects, but not between objects directly. The photo gives him knowledge of the woman that's depicted in it, and he's able to reveal this secret to the doctor. Your mother's not dead. She had amnesia. She got married. But she remembers now. The precognition comes in slightly less often than the psychometry and what I guess might be called postcognition if we're really trying to hammer down power names, but it seems to happen primarily with people. He knows that Jimmy Carter will be president at some point, for instance, when he shakes his hand, and he knows that his student will die if he goes to the restaurant party, but the main thing that we see is that louse of a human being, Stilson. When he shakes Greg Stilson's hand, he comes to know something terrible that has not yet happened, and that's the actual curse of having this power set. If it were just that Johnny could touch a thing and know about it, that wouldn't even really be that bad, and it would have prevented the main conflict of the book from actually happening. Like, he might have discovered that Stilson used to sell Bibles, or that he was exceptionally cruel to animals, or that he was a black male specialist, but all those things are not reason enough to just kill the dude. It's the knowledge of what he will do that becomes the burden of action. Not what he is but what he will become. There is another theme, and this one is one that uh, you could definitely write some papers on as well. Uh, this is the theme of the attribution of faith to something and faith's use in manipulation, and that gets played with quite a lot 
in the book. Like, we're first introduced to the idea when we get the young Stilson selling Bibles to people door to door right next to a conspiracy theory right-wing propaganda book that he ties together with them. You buy the Bible, you buy the right-wing propaganda book, both of those things become entwined with you. Now, the right-wing propaganda exists in the same space as the faith in whatever god you choose to believe comes from the Bible. Religion is treated from the get-go as a vehicle for brainwashing and persuasion, which it is in real life as well. I'm looking at you, all organized religion. I mean, Stilson would make some money with the Bible, sure, but he knew that he could almost always hook those who were gullible enough to read that poorly written fiction into reading more poorly written fiction. Thus, we get that sort of link between manipulation and religion. And then we have Johnny's mom, who is a devout Christian with a bit of a tinfoil hat streak at the beginning of the story, but who passes through into the land of truly crazy, like, bonkers cult stuff during the coma filler arc. She believes in this invisible sky man, and this belief is basically the big chalk X on her back at the carnival that tells all the scam artists that she's an easy target. And that is an understatement if ever there was one when it comes to her. When she finally does die, she is so far into the crackpot, alien spaceship to heaven theories that it's a relief of sorts for Johnny's father. These two images set up the idea of using manipulative tactics based on getting into the heads of blind followers with incendiary attention-getting tactics, and then driving those followers into the ground once these efforts work. Johnny himself, for instance, is an object of faith for a large number of people for a long time, and several times, as it were, when the first report of his encounter with the reporter gets broadcast nationwide. Like, people start sending him packages, trinkets, objects in the mail, hoping that he will use his magic psychometry power to tell them the information that they want regarding this object, much in the same way that people would flock to faith healers, like Benny Hinn and all of them, in hopes that their snake oil performances would result in something. Now, surely there are some people who do it because they like the idea of of being included in something bigger than themselves, the people who go to church for community but not for God. But there are also people who genuinely believe th in the, the weird magic or the divine power or the alien technology or whatever other cult bullshit it is, because fundamentally, humans are gullible and look for ways to shift responsibility off themselves onto things that they don't have to care about whether they understand. Johnny tries his best to downplay his powers because he understands this, and the only reason that people know about him is because of the attention-getting headlines that he generates whenever he does a thing. Contrast this with Greg Stilson, who has no powers except for his oratory skill and his criminal abilities, but who manages to build a nationwide veritable cult to himself through the very same tactics that religious garbage assholes use. First, do something incendiary and loud and attention-getting, and then continue to do that thing and variations on it to generate more attention. Then, play into the insecurities and doubts of those who would stop to listen. And then finally, sucker them into supporting your cause. Political chicanery and religious zealotry have so much in common they could have been bedfellows at birth. I'm looking at you, the United States. Johnny is the object of faith for a select few because he demonstrated real results in a supernatural way, but he tries to escape that attention because, in his view, it only resulted in nobody's happiness. Stilson, however, is a snake oil salesman from the beginning, desiring the attention and manufacturing it by whatever means is necessary, criminal or otherwise. It's almost like Johnny could have the very real power and recognition that Stilson wants, if only Johnny said he wanted it. Stilson makes a good villain because of this juxtaposition. This book is several hundred pages long, and there's a lot of story in it spread over a few sort of arcs. There are very few, like, twists or mysteries in the plot, because it wouldn't make sense for there to be something about which Johnny, our main, like, focus protagonist, 
could not know. So in a way that we experience the story, we experience it much in the same way that Johnny might have, minus the horrible, life-shattering injuries and coma. The only real twist that we, the readers, experience is the posthumously revealed fact that Johnny had a brain tumor that was going to kill him. He, of course, could not have foreseen it, because it's that very part of his brain that was damaged in the slip on the ice initially, and then in the car crash thereafter, that gives him his superpowers. I'm pretty sure in the movie version, like one of them, I think there might be multiples, he even calls that part of his brain the dead zone, which is both not inaccurate and very funny. The last part of the book is epistolary, and tells in rapid-fire succession what happened right after Johnny died. Sarah goes to visit Johnny's grave, and while the readers get glimpses of Stilson getting just destroyed in court after having used a child as a human shield against some bullets and having his career completely shattered, Sarah feels what we are supposed to assume is something like Johnny's ghost touch her on the shoulder before, of course, she turns around and there's nothing there. The end. Johnny ostensibly saved the world. He didn't end up actually killing Stilson, but his actions resulted in the same outcome as if he had killed Stilson, because Stilson reveals his true colors, the type of person who would use a child as a bullet shield, and that was caught on camera, someone took a picture of this happening, and was able to escape Stilson's thugs and wasn't killed, and gave it to the press, and then the whole thing started going down. There's a bunch of trials, all the, the bad stuff that Stilson did comes out, and he gets just completely wrecked and destroyed, and he loses his career as a politician which prevents him from being in a position where he would be able to destroy the world with a nuclear war. So in the end, even though Johnny didn't kill him, despite no lack of trying on Johnny's part, everything worked. Everything worked out. So, good on you, Johnny. It's fine. Like, the version that I've got is just shy of 600 pages, probably one of King's longer works. And there's a lot that happens in a lot of places to a lot of people. So if you're not the kind of person that, like, starts a spreadsheet when you start reading a new book to put in, like, character names, important stuff, and why we know about them, this one might give you some trouble trying to keep track of everybody and, like, why they're important and, like, the timeline that everything is happening in. I don't know, I don't think this is on my read twice list. It's worth the read for sure, but don't treat your copy like it's a princess. It's meant to be read and then given to someone else so that they can read it and give it to someone else, and so on and so on. Plus, and this is a big deal breaker, there is violence against a dog in the first couple chapters, and that is a huge turnoff for some people. So if you can stomach Stilson being a literal, actual monster, give the book a shot. It's not bad. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I know that it's been a long time since I posted a video, uh, and that's because I am bad at this. We'll see how it continues on. Um, yeah, I am well into the reading slog of my PhD stuff, and so the next couple books are probably going to be classic sci-fi books. So we're going to be talking about things like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? and Neuromancer, and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and all of those. Because I feel like if I don't make videos on the books that I am reading for the PhD, I will feel like I am not using my time as well as I could in the process thereof. So, uh, expect some more videos at some point. I can't ever make promises anymore. Uh, thank you guys for coming and watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, the like and subscribe buttons are just below this video. You know how... YouTube works. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. Like, please. That'd be cool. I'd appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, we will see you guys sometime soon with a sci-fi book, I guess. We will see you next time.